Are you tired of sugarcoating how you feel about infertility? The Infertility in Me podcast offers raw and candid discussions about all things infertility and IVF. Join me, Monique, your host, as we get real about the emotional, physical, and mental effects of infertility and what it does to its victims. Hashtag infertility sucks. Please be advised, adult content and language. So we have Jennifer Robertson today all the way from Australia. How exciting is that? She's coming on to uh, give her journey of seven plus years, if I'm not mistaken, Miss Jennifer, is that correct? That is correct. And so she's just going to tell us a little bit about her journey to parenthood and motherhood and what that was like for her. So can we start at the beginning, Jennifer? How long were you guys married before you decided to have children? We actually decided to have kids when we were to start having or trying to have children when we were on our honeymoon. So we'd gotcha. been together for about a year and a half. Um, mm-hmm. And I was, I was 33 at the time that I got married. So I guess in pregnancy years, that is quite old. And I was feeling <laughs> the pressure. So, yeah, so yeah. yeah, when we were on our honeymoon, I, we actually decided to start trying it was all planned I am a huge planner down to the the minute the hour Mm -hmm. absolutely everything so so I had actually predicted you know well I'm going to fall pregnant in you know and have a straight away and have a baby in nine months and then this will be happening so I had it all planned out perfectly in my head how it was going to turn out and how it turned out I couldn't have been further from Mm. the picture in my head. So I was 33. We just got married. We're on our honeymoon. We were trying to have a baby. And after about three months and nothing had happened, I was, I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit disappointed. Okay. And then after six months and still nothing happening, I was getting a little bit worried. And so we went to our local doctor Mm -hmm. and, they prescribed me to just to go to a fertility specialist straight away. And so we didn't even think about it. I'm very much the type of person that if I have a problem, I Mm -hmm. look for a solution and they were promising me a solution. So to be honest with you, when we were trying to decide whether we go down the IVF path, it just wasn't a consideration for me. We were we were both working, we had enough money. And as I said, I had a problem and this was the solution that, that we thought. So we yeah. pretty much jumped, jumped straight into, into IVF. Okay. And okay. yeah, so that was probably about, um, probably about a year, a year after we had started trying, we, we jumped straight into IVF. Wow. And, and you went through the whole workup, of course, with the hysteroscopy and things like that to determine what was causing your infertility or did you have unexplained infertility? Well, it was unexplained. And so we, it just, yeah, there was, there was just no, no reason we'd, we'd done a, an exploratory surgery and they couldn't see anything. So it was just, it was just IVF. And so we went through the first cycle and and we actually got a, a few embryos, which was mm-hmm. fantastic. But when they went to do the transfer, they discovered that I didn't have a lining on my uterus. And wow. that there was nothing that they could see that was causing it. And so we tried a couple of things and, and it didn't work. And so my IVF specialist at the time she said that she would go away and do some research to see how we could thicken up my lining because obviously if the if your lining's not thick there's you can't do a transfer it's just there's right, there's nothing exactly. for the embryo to stick to so she said that she'd go away and and do some research and we never heard back from her so wow. obviously we were put into the too hard basket for her which was really disappointing and and this journey is completely filled with moments where you feel like you're floating. And exactly. for someone like me, I'm very type A personality. Mm-hmm. I need a process to follow. I need a to-do list. I just need to feel like I'm moving forward. All and those analytical things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we were floating for the first time in quite some, you know, or what would actually be 
a lot of times that we were floating in this whole seven year process. So mm-hmm. um, that was the first taste. And we, we went around and we did some research and we tried different diets. We tried acupuncture. We, um, we even saw a sign one day for a homeopath and she was offering a money back guarantee. She would be able to, to make you fall pregnant or give you your money back. And so we went there and three months later, she was giving us our money back because that didn't work either. And wow. so, yeah, so we kept on floating. And then a couple of months later, I got in touch with another fertility specialist that a friend had recommended to me. And that set us on a whole different path that we never mm-hmm. really thought that we would go down. And so they did more tests and we tried vitamin E tablets. We tried Viagra pessaries, all of the things, more exploratory surgeries to try to thicken my lining. And then eventually they came to the conclusion that there was no other way for us to conceive a child that was ours naturally other than, than surrogacy. Wow. Wow. And you're actually the first person I've had on the podcast thus far. And I'm I'm a very new podcast, as you know, that has the surrogacy uh, experience. So this is, um, this is great. And I'm glad that I was able to get you on here and we were able to coordinate our schedules because I'm pretty sure that there's plenty of people out there listening who, you know, at some point, or if for medical reasons, reasons like yourself, they may have to go that route to grow their family. And so did you guys wait after you realized that you're going to have to be surrogacy? How long did you wait before you went on to that path? Well, we were really lucky. So lucky in one respect, unlucky in another. So in Australia, commercial surrogacy is not legal at all. So you need to actually know the person Mm -hmm. and it cannot be for commercial gain. So you can't pay someone. They just have to do it out of the goodness of their heart, which is such a big ask of anyone who's ever Mm. had a child to just do that off off their own bat. And we were very, very lucky in the fact that my sister-in-law, my husband's sister, Mm -hmm. had, when we were struggling, she'd actually put her hand up and said flippantly, well, I'll have a baby for you. And little did she know that a few months later, we'd actually be knocking on her door and going, well, are you serious? Because this is what we're told we have to do now. And, um, and yeah, she, she said yes, which is just, I look back now and having gone through what I've gone through myself personally, it's one of the biggest things that anyone can ever do for you without financial gain. So we weren't paying her. She was just doing this for for the love of it, which I think is just such an amazing thing. There are some really beautiful people out there and we're very blessed that we, that we have her in our life. So so yes, we, we decided, we agreed she was going to be our surrogate and that started us on a whole new, very, very long process. And so in Australia, you have to go before a board of, board of doctors and prove that this is the only way that, that you can actually have a, a baby naturally. So they have mm-hmm. to approve it. You have to seek, um, you have to get a surrogacy agreement drawn up. So you both have to have legal advice. We had to go and see counsellors. Um, mm-hmm. Renee had a husband and and two boys of her own. So mm-hmm. they had to undergo the counselling because from from their point of view, their, you know, the boys, her boys, their mum mm-hmm. was actually going to have a baby, but it wasn't going to be their little brother or sister. So that was a right. whole thing that had to be explained to to them as well. And so we took all of our family on this journey and, and eventually it was, it probably took us about six months from deciding that we were going to go down the surrogacy route to actually Mm -hmm. having it signed off and then going, okay, let's proceed with this now. Wow. I can only imagine. Oh my gosh. That is, um, that's just so touching. I apologize. I was sniffling because I had tears in my eyes. It was, that is, that is the most selfless act one of the most selfless acts that I could ever think of that somebody would do for a family member, that and it being your sister-in-law. Oh my God, that just brings. <laughs> I know, it gives me, it gives me gooses now wow. every time I, I talk about it because it's such a beautiful thing. And I, but I guess at the, at the same tone, 
at that point, I was handing over responsibility or I was <laughs> handing over this beautiful gift, this thing, this picture that I had in my hand of, I'd always pictured that I'd be pregnant. Right. And so on this journey, on this fertility journey, there are so many moments that we're, that we're grieving because mm -hmm. we're having to mm -hmm. say goodbye to that picture that we had in our head. You know, we thought that, that it would happen straight away and it's not. We would thought that it would happen via love making out mm -hmm. of love mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. going down the IVF path and it, it being, you know, conceived in a laboratory. And, and same with yep. us. So surrogacy for, for me was, was a part, while I, was, I felt really blessed, I was also mm -hmm. grieving the idea that mm -hmm. I would actually be able to feel my baby kick, my baby grow inside yeah. of me and, and get to know them beforehand. So, so it was beautiful, but it also was disappointing that this is what we had mm -hmm. to do. And it was also fearful as well, because we all have that fear. When you, I think when you go through, down the path of surrogacy, we all think, will they give me the baby back? because yeah. all of a sudden and and I've spoken to so many women who have who have been surrogates or who have been on the other side and we all have that fear mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. from the perspective of the woman who's carrying the baby she doesn't want it and and from the outset and we've spoken to Renee since then and, and she she always knew that that it was it was her nephew or her niece that she was mm -hmm. going to be carrying and same mm -hmm. with her boys like her children always knew that it was their their cousin that was actually inside her so that's one of the fears that we go in but it's it's not really a valid or it's it doesn't really come to pass so i think on this journey as well we have all of these fears that mm -hmm. that really never come true yeah, and that's one of the many side effects of infertility, you know, raising our our anxieties, raising our fears, and um, just making us all around kind of baddie a little bit when we're going through these things while trying to also stay positive, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. The thoughts that go in our, around and around in our head really have a huge impact on absolutely everything, you know, our mental state, our our physical state as well. So, um, so yes, we, we're all there and we decided, yep, let's do this. And, and then it didn't happen. And so we have had the first transfer. We were like, yes, we had this picture in our head again. Mm -hmm. You'd think I would have learned by now to get rid of that picture in my head. But, you know, we, we were like, yes, this is going to happen. First go. And it didn't happen first go. So we were really disappointed about that. And then I had to go for another egg pickup. So I was going through IVF cycles, mm -hmm. creating embryos, and then, and then having them implanted into Renee. And, and we did that for quite some time. We did mm -hmm. that. And I, don't, I didn't really realize how long we were on that roller coaster for until mm -hmm. I decided in February that I was going to write a book about my journey. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I, I had to go back to the medical records because for me, it was just such a blur. It was yeah. this, this thing where we're in it and we can't see anything else. And it becomes this, this vicious cycle that we just need to get to the finish line. Yeah. And we just, we shut out absolutely everything else out. So, so for five years, we were on that, that roller coaster trying to conceive mm -hmm. our little boy by our surrogate. And five years, I really had no idea how many cycles that we went through. And when I tallied it up at the end, it was nine cycles that we went through to try oh, to get gracious. our little boy. Yeah. And, and I guess the, the really tough thing was, if it wasn't tough enough, was the fact that we were dragging her and her family along with us. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just us that, we, that had made the decision. We, she was living our fertility or infertility journey as well. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so it was tough. Um, she had a miscarriage and that was probably one of the toughest points as well, because we had done this to her and we never, yeah. yeah. And she had never had a miscarriage before. So this yeah. was something that was completely new for all of us. And, and I guess we, we just kind of retreated into our corners because we weren't quite, we couldn't comfort each other because we were just so, 
we were trying to be so brave for each other, I think. Yeah. And it was, it was just the three of us in this vicious cycle that we could not escape. But that miscarriage, how, as devastating as it was, because, of course, she felt guilt as well because she was trying to make us a baby and she couldn't. And so she was taking on all of this, this responsibility because she now felt responsibility for the fact that we didn't have a baby and it wasn't her fault. It yeah. was no one's fault. And so after that miscarriage, it sparked something in us. And I, and I can't put my finger on it, but in this journey, we, we forget to hope. Well, it's not that we forget to hope. We don't like to hope because we <laughs> feel that if we have too much hope, then we'll be even more disappointed. Yeah. And so, but what this miscarriage did was it gave us hope. Because all of a sudden, we hadn't fall, fallen pregnant. I'd never seen two lines on a pregnancy test before ever. And mm. all of a sudden, we knew that we could do it. And so we took a break for a little while and we all came back and just were like, this is, this is going to happen. We are going to do this. And a couple of cycles later, we fell pregnant again and, and this one stuck. And now we have little Luca who just turned five years old uh, wow. last week. Yeah. So it was, it was a huge journey. Um, it was, it had so many ups and downs. It had so many beautiful moments. It had so many moments where I was wrestling with this picture in my head and, you know, I, I never got to, to feel feel Luca you know his first movements I, I, I missed out on so much but when it gets to the end and mm -hmm. when you get that baby in your arms it all kind of it all kind of floats away and it doesn't matter anymore because you've got to the end and you've got what you what you wanted yeah and the baby's there in your arms ready to go you, oh wow but well, that is uh, mm. the journey wow and, and as you know, the blessing on all, all of this is that you guys, I'm sure that are very much closer to uh, your sister-in-law. Of course, your brother, bro your husband mm -hmm. and his sister are always close, but it has probably brought you guys into a relationship of closeness that you, that you probably wouldn't have had not going through all of this. I can only, I can only imagine, and I won't assume, so I'm going to ask you, had it brought you and your sister-in-law closer, once, especially once you got to the end and the baby was there? And the new life was there for you guys as family. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and I just love seeing Luca and and her together. It's just it's just this beautiful moment. And there's no point in time where I think she took something away from us, or I missed out on something, or that I wish things were different. I mm -hmm. now have got to the end, and and our story doesn't end there. But I got to that point where I just didn't feel, I mean, it's beautiful. It is seriously beautiful now just, just looking at them because she has such a love for him and they have mm. this nice little bond that's just, and they have this beautiful little story as well that we can, we can tell them and we share with other people. And I must admit to begin with, I didn't embrace it because I still felt it was a sign of weakness mm. on my behalf. The fact that I couldn't do it myself, the fact that I had to outsource it. Mm -hmm. And, and for a long time I did, I did kind of shy away from telling people because I, I, I didn't like our story. And so it doesn't end there. Uh, two weeks it was two weeks after Luca was born. I fell pregnant myself. What? What a strange turn of events. That is I know. incredible. I know. Wow. I know. And, and I, I know that we, we say to everyone who's still on their journey, just relax and it'll happen. Yes. And, and I, I, I just, I don't, I, you know, everyone who's on that journey and someone tells them to, to, to relax, it's just, it's the most insensitive thing that you can probably say yes, to someone. Absolutely. But, but it was proof that, yeah, I just was in such a beautiful space and I was feeling an immense amount of love and I wasn't stressed. I wasn't trying. I wasn't pushing. I wasn't doing all of those things. And all of a sudden, 
it, it came back and this journey as well, no one really talks about the effect that it has on your relationship. Mm-mm, mm-mm. And, and, and my husband and I have only really now, and it's 10 years since we, we started trying for a baby. We've only just now really started to rebuild our, our relationship yeah. and, and, and started to talk about the effect that a fertility journey has on on the male as well because mm-hmm. we're just trying to survive and it's our body and it's I guess from a female perspective I, I used to think it's my responsibility and I am yeah. failing and so so now we're just talking about it and the effect that it has on your relationship is really really it's it's big and as I said we just don't talk about it so so we're talking about it about Wonderful. it now and Wonderful. and you know and so so after we had had this baby we we started having sex again and not that we weren't before but it just was from a different perspective it was no Absolutely. longer with the the shadow or that umbrella of infertility hanging over our heads because it wasn't it's a timed thing or you we can't have sex now because i'm just going through a cycle or mm-hmm. you know it just it just came back and yeah as soon as that came back as soon as i i took a step back and stopped pushing so much and, and stopped focusing on the fertility and the, the impact that it was had, having on my life, it, it happened. And it's unexplained, completely yeah. unexplained. Yeah. And you I can about me asking, do you feel like after you, after the, after little Luca was born and you, you guys started reconnecting on a deeper level, do you kind of feel like you picked up where you left off after getting married because you guys were newlyweds? in the beginning of the infertility infertility process? Um, I think, I think this journey changes you. I think it changes your relationship. So Mm -hmm. I don't think we went straight back to where we, where we were. I think it was just a a different type of relationship and we're evolving all of the time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the, the old days. And to be honest with you, we had a baby. So it's not going to be going back to, to the way it was on our honeymoon to any degree at all. But okay. it was freer. It was a lot yeah. freer. There was no trying. So it was, I believe that it was, it was in a, a better spot. Mm-hmm. And so here I was pregnant with a two week old newborn baby and, and shocked we were very shocked and you know it was it was something that had never happened before and so after we got over the shock we because we thought well Luca was just going to be our only baby and we were quite happy with that Mm -hmm. and so we kind of stepped off that roller coaster and it was about six weeks later Mm -hmm. I had a miscarriage Mm -hmm. and that I can if if we can if I had to choose one moment on the fertility journey where I was the lowest, the angriest, the absolutely seething, it was that moment because I had finally gotten off that fertility roller coaster. Right. Only to be thrown back on with this surprise pregnancy, which I had really been longing for all along. It was, Mm -hmm. I I just wanted to carry my own baby. I just wanted to, to get that positive pregnancy test. I just Mm -hmm. wanted to feel absolutely everything. I wanted the morning sickness. I wanted the labor. I wanted to experience absolutely everything. And so, so then we were like, we're on. And, and I was told that, yes, you're going to have everything that you had possibly dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And then it was taken away. So suddenly, and I was angry because we'd gotten off and yeah. we were living our happily ever after. And we'd gone through so much over those five years to get where we were. And, and then all of a sudden I couldn't really appreciate it. I couldn't really live in it and be happy in that mm-hmm. moment because I was, I was mourning the loss of another baby. It's just so tumultuous and so arduous sometimes the way things transpire in our lives and like you said you know to be fully present and mindful in the situation of Luca now being here and then feeling stuck did you kind of feel stuck a little bit after the miscarriage because it's like good well goodness gracious am I I've got to be happy for the new baby but I'm also sad for the one I just lost 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and, and it still upsets me when I think about it now, but it showed me so much as well. Number one, it showed me, hang on, I can get pregnant. So while I was down and really low in the back of my mind, I was like, well, there's a little bit of hope here. Yeah. There's something that I didn't really realize. And it also gave me an appreciation. I don't know whether it's an appreciation is the right word, but I realized then what Renee had gone through. Mm -hmm. So I was able to feel what she had gone through when she had her miscarriage. And so I was able to perhaps support or just, just feel what she went through. So I could really appreciate, yes, I could appreciate Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. full magnitude of what she did for us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we picked ourselves up like we did on many occasions on our fertility journey, which is exactly what we do. We, we grieved, we picked ourselves up and we dusted ourselves off and, and we kept on getting at it. Mm -hmm. And I never told my husband this, but I was secretly trying, you know how, when you're trying, but you're not trying. (laughs) It's one of those things where we're just going to have a yeah. break this month. Meanwhile, in your head, you're still trying because you're still monitoring oh, absolutely marriage. everything. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so six months later, we fell pregnant again, again, completely unexplained. And then, yeah, it stuck. And now we have Sophie, who's, who's three and a half. You and so it's six months after the miscarriage. Yes. Yeah. So there's 17 months in between Luca and Sophie. And we have our perfect, perfect little family. And once again, me having Sophie cemented the realization of, once again, the magnitude of what Renee had done for us because I had actually been pregnant and, and felt the impact and the physical, the emotional impacts mm-hmm. that being pregnant has on your body. And, and you know, I keep on saying to Renee, you did that for us. You had a miscarriage. You went through the whole journey with us. You, you, you ha- had a baby for us, and mm-hmm. it just—it still blows my mind that someone would have done that for no other reason but love. Yeah, and that's and you know that is the true definition. Your story is the true definition of unconditional love, and mm-hmm. everything and everything that it means in every sense <laughs> of the word unconditional. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just purely. Uh, it's, that's, that is just such an awesome, awesome journey that um, yeah, you guys absolutely. went on when you think about it from the positive end of it, you know. And Yes, I, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. And, <laughs> but, it, but it's one of those things where you just do what you have to do. And if you really want the result at the end, if you are confident that, that this is what you want, you will go through and you will endure so much just to get what you want. Indeed. And I've always, mm-hmm. I've, I've always, I've always been a big believer. If you work hard at something, mm-hmm. you're going to get it. And infertility was the first time that I was actually taught. Well, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter the harder you work that you're going to, that you're going to get it. But it taught me that if you keep on picking yourself up and learning all along the path, then then the journey is so much more important than than anything else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, because, it, you know, I always tell people, you know, you know that you're going to reach your destination, but how you go through the, the middle parts to the end is significant because it will make or break you and it will, you know, and it can be the, the it, it will go through it and how you deal with it in the midst of the journey. And it's not mm-hmm. going to be perfect. And I'm not saying that it should be, but getting through it, like you said, the best way that you can um, without going completely insane is what makes us human. And I, mm-hmm. and I don't know about you, but I feel like when I went through the journey myself, it made me more vulnerable and it made me more empathetic to other people. And mm-hmm. Do you feel that it, it brought out the, another side of you, a more emotional side of you, because you said that you are an A-type, alpha female type? Do you think that it brought out a more emotional side of you that has helped you become a better mother or be a oh, better mother? 
100%. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, while we were on our journey, we probably didn't handle it the way mm-hmm. that you should. And now looking back, I've learned so much just from reflecting on the things that we went through, the things mm-hmm. that we could have done better. And there are so many lessons that, that I have learned that I now am implementing into my life. And you're 100% right. I do believe that, I do believe that there's a lesson and this has taught me resilience. It has taught me patience. Mm -hmm. It has taught me to let go of that picture in, in our head of how we think that things are going to turn out or how they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. It has taught me to let go of perfection Things yes. don't need to be perfect. They just need to be done. So I've learned so many things on this journey and that has helped me become a better mother because Absolutely. you need all of those things because <laughs> it's not perfect. You have yeah. no control. You need patience. And so if I was the person on my honeymoon trying to raise two children, they'd, they'd eat me up alive. Whereas now <laughs> I feel like it's taught me so many things along, along the way that, that it does, it really does help now. And because there were so many learnings and because there were so many things that I felt like I could have done better, it's mm-hmm. led me on the path that I'm on now. So, so now I'm a fertility mentor and coach. So yep. now I'm helping other women who are going through exactly the same as what I've gone through because my journey included everything everything mm-hmm. that you can possibly Imagine. think yeah, of. Yeah, you went through it. Uh, wow. Yeah, we went through the surrogacy. I went through supporting someone else go through a mis- miscarriage. We went through IVF cycles. We went through failed egg pickups. I went through a pregnancy myself. I went through a miscarriage. Like our story encompasses absolutely everything. So, and and as I was saying, I learned so many things that that I did on the way and it wasn't, do what I do. This is, Mm -hmm. I now know how I can make it easier for other women who are on this journey. And it is such a lonely journey. You would know yourself. It's so lonely. As much as you have friends and family around you who are supportive, they don't say the right things, even though they mean well. They don't do the right things. They don't know how to comfort you. And we don't know how to comfort, how, how to get comfort either. We don't know yeah. what we want, yeah. Yeah. but what gives us comfort is knowing that we're not alone and knowing that there are other women out there who have been through it, who know, who, who have felt all of the same things and who have got out the other side as well. And, mm-hmm. and there's comfort in, you know, all of the thoughts that, that your audience and the women who are still on this journey are having, they're all valid. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person because you're not happy for your friend who's Mm -hmm. just announced their pregnancy it doesn't mean that you're a bad person because we all have the same thoughts it doesn't mean that you're a bad person because you're angry that you have to go down this path it doesn't mean that you're a failure it just all of the thoughts that we have we all have them and until we start talking about it Mm -hmm. then then we kind of sit in this little bubble and And we push it down and we push it down and we push it down. And then all of a sudden you're at work, you're sitting at your desk, someone says the wrong thing and and you just blast them without knowing why. And it's because we keep it all in, but there is such, such comfort and therapy in sharing and talking within a safe container as well. I don't mean that you have to shout it out on Instagram if you, if you don't want to you don't have to do all of those things. There are places that you can go to that will provide you with the comfort to know that you're not alone. And when you we can actually speak freely without fear of judgment. And I'd love the, the, the one of the tips you have here or things to remember for those who are in the journey about being resilient and being patient in the journey. I think that's important because there will be so, you know, there's so many people, acquaintances, family members, everybody who come to you asking, when are you guys going to have kids? When are you going to have, for me, it was when I was going to have another one. When, you know, I was about the same age and when we started our journey as you were. So it was like, you know, people asking me all the time, are you guys going to slow down and have kids? 
um, you know, people outside of the family, uh, are you guys going to have kids? Are you, do you want two kids? All of these different things without even knowing what you were going through and what you were dealing with in your personal life. And it, the journey teaches you not only to be patient for having a baby and creating a family, but how to deal with people and, and navigating the patients dealing with people because they're just ignorant to what you're going through. Absolutely. And that, and that's what I do now. So I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with women. Like I run a number of programs. I have a, a private Facebook community where I, I pour into awesome. and provide with tips and tricks on how you, how you can deal with it. And I guess from what I have learned, like the big thing for mm -hmm. me and what I, what I teach all of the women who kind of come into my community is that this journey does not have to consume you. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to become all of you and and it's so easy and you don't even realize it that you wake yeah. up one day and you don't remember what you like you don't remember the last time that you that you actually went out and laughed and you don't remember how you want to feel it's just this all-consuming thing mm -hmm. and you don't realize until you're completely underneath and and i'll admit i lived five years of, it was five years of living a half life that I never felt joy. I never felt all of the things. I was just going through the motions because I had this goal of having a baby and that was it. Whereas now I teach women that they can actually be these amazing people. They can, they don't have to sacrifice absolutely everything. Fertility can be a part of their life, but it doesn't have to absolutely be the be-all, end-all consuming thing because I think we think that a baby fixes mm -hmm. absolutely everything. These are feelings and things, and you would know yourself, they don't just go away as soon mm -hmm. as you get a baby in your arms. These are, these are valid feelings that this is life-changing, this journey that we're on, and it just doesn't go away. I mm -hmm. still remember... Mm -hmm quite some time ago, I would, I would see someone who was pregnant or someone would tell me that they were pregnant. And even though I had two babies of my own, I still had that, that mm -hmm. habit, that twinge of, Oh, and then I would have to remind yeah. myself, well, I don't have to be angry anymore because I'm on the other side. And still, still to this day, when I get my period, I still have that pang of <laughs> oh, disappointment. Because yeah. it's it was it was a habit a that we thing. had all yeah. Of, yeah for so long. So it's so important that while we're on this journey, we need to live, not that we've got our life on hold. We need to to just be us, and we need yeah. to remember that we're amazing regardless of whether we have a baby or not. And there are so many things that we can do. And and you were talking about the insensitive comments and things like that. And there are so many things that we can do to set boundaries. And, and I actually have a, a coaching client that I had a call with her last night mm -hmm. and she's doing this on her own. So she doesn't have a partner, which I just wow. think is the, one of the most bravest things. Yes. And, and she's doing this all by herself. And well, obviously she has me and she has friends and family, yeah, but yeah. you know, she's doing this by herself. And she went in for the egg pickup last night, yesterday mm -hmm. and, and the nurse turned to her and said, Oh, you're doing this by your lonesome. That's really sad. And mm -hmm. I was like, what did she say to you? She's like, yeah, she said that to me. And I'm like, what did you do? She's like, nothing. I was fine. She's like, I'm completely secure in what I'm doing. And and I just said to her, yeah, I'm doing it. And, and that just proves to me. So we've been, we've been coaching for, for four months. And so when she came to me, like mm -hmm. that's what we work on. So we can get people, you know, we can get to that point where we're so secure in our path mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. can say those ridiculously insensitive things. And it just reflects off us. Yeah. Like we, can, we can be yeah. so secure. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so there, if I can, provide your audience with anything it is that is it's hope so we can actually be in this journey we can not only get to the end but we can still have this beautiful life and it doesn't have to consume us right now while we're on the journey and I love that I love I, and I was just getting ready to reiterate it but you just said it having a life outside of infertility while you're still in the midst of infertility or having fertility issues, egg donor, anything. That is the tagline of the century right there. It's just not forgetting to live your life in the midst of it all. And I wish yes. that I had done more of it. 
wish that I had yes, done me too. Of, you know oh my goodness so many trips I could have taken you know just for a weekend get away with my husband and stuff like that and we did it at the end we finally got it at the end but the four years in between it was like not happening and we were drowning ourselves in our work and it was just I wish I could go back and change out one little thing if anything that is awesome and I'm going to definitely put that in our show notes to remind everybody to live your life even in the midst of it all Oh my gosh. Wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and owning our story, because I think that we get, for me, there was a lot of shame around it and I didn't really share my journey Mm -hmm. with, with anyone. And, and even, even I got to the end and it wasn't like I started, I started coaching and everything in February of this year. And up until then, I had never really embraced my story. There was still Mm. that little bit of shame around the fact that I had to outsource my pregnancy. And it wasn't, and I think it was like, I just didn't accept it. And, and it wasn't until uh, my little boy, Luca was starting to express some interest in other women who were pregnant around us. And he was gotcha. talking about, and, and we'd always said that we would tell him we wouldn't, okay. we, we weren't going to keep it a secret, but we weren't ready to tell him because I still wasn't comfortable with the fact that I'd actually had to have someone else have my baby. Yes, and so yes. he was, he was, he was really asking and he must have sensed us trying to evade the, the question because he turned to me one day and we were actually in the car. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't go anywhere. And we, and he just said to me, mommy, was I in your tummy? And my mm. husband and I took this big deep breath in. We looked at each other and, and I just turned to him and said, well, well, no, Luca, my tummy was broken. And so Aunty Renee had you in her tummy and then my wow. tummy got better. And then I was able to have Sophie and, and it was, it was this moment where I was terrified because I was like, I don't accept it. How, what, yeah. if, what am I going to do if he How doesn't? He and react? he just, yeah. yeah. And he looked at us and went, okay. And started babbling on about something else. So he didn't, it didn't bother him. He was so quick to accept kids. it. <laughs> yeah. Kids. Oh man. And it just made and, it so much simpler. You know, because yes. we get older and we forget how simple some things in life can be. Not everything is black and white, but, you know, we just forget the simplicity of it all because he's like, look, I'm here anyway. It doesn't matter if, if my mom did it or my auntie did it. I'm here. I'm Lisa. You know, so that, oh my gosh, kids. It's exactly kids. right. And, and, and from, the, from the mouths of babes, like, it just doesn't matter. And we get so caught up on that picture in our head yeah. and the way things are supposed to go supposed and to that be. perfection. Yep that we forget the things that are really important. He didn't care. It didn't matter to him how he got here. He's here. And and I think that we can really take a lesson out of that as well. And it wasn't until, you know, and, and we've had so many beautiful moments since then. And, and the fact that he's accepted it and the fact that whenever I tell people about our story, they, they could start crying. So yeah. it's just so beautiful. And, and that has been the, I guess the motivation or the, the thing that has really pushed me to, to now help other women through it because now I accept my story and, and I love my Mm -hmm. story. And that's what Mm -hmm. we're all creating right now. We're all creating our own stories and yeah, Yeah. we could have the perfect, yes, I started trying on my honeymoon and then I, and then I fell pregnant straight away and had a baby or we can have this amazing story to tell our children Mm -hmm. that we fought so hard for them and we didn't give up and we love them before they even got here. So we can have one or the other. And if I had to choose my epic seven year journey that costs us hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of dollars, many tears, Ooh. so many ups and downs, or the the perfect, I'd choose my story a hundred times over. Yeah. Because it just it just it's put me on this path. It's taught me so many things and we've just got a great story. Yeah. And that's I what it's all about. It. I love the fact that you allowed your painful situation to turn into something purposeful and passionate and that you could give back so those three things it became your purpose you became passionate about it and it's allowing you to give back to other women and other men who may need that mentor that coach that we didn't get a chance to have you know when we were going through it and that is amazing awesome yeah awesome yeah Thank you so much, Jennifer, for coming on all the way from Australia. I'm so freaking excited. I cannot wait for everybody to hear your episode. And I'm going to put all of your information into the show link so that anybody that comes and watch, listens, I should say not watch, but listens, will be able to get in contact with you through your social 
social media handles as well as your coaching services too, because I think that's important. You know, even in the Facebook groups, you can get really intimate in there, but sometimes people just want to speak to you and, and, and connect mm-hmm. with you one-on-one. And so that is awesome. And I, I do appreciate you again. You have no idea what it means for you to come and uh, speak to us today and, and give us your insight and your experience on infertility and sur- surrogacy and then becoming naturally pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all of the work that you're doing. I think it's so important to shine a light on this on this subject so that women just don't feel like they're alone. Yeah. Thank you.